Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to welcome you all today to our Thrive Community Forum with Congresswoman Jackie Spear. This is a virtual town hall. And today's topic is how the American Rescue Plan will affect San Mateo County nonprofits. And then we really want this to be a conversation between you and the Congresswoman. We know that's what she prefers. Uh, and we know that all of you have a lot of questions as well. And this is really a historic moment. Uh, there are uh, unprecedented funds coming into uh, states, counties, and cities, um, and local jurisdictions. Thrive has been very active in meeting with the county, meeting, meeting with local representatives, advocating at the state level uh, on these issues that are gonna impact how funds are invested. And we know that right now it's important for nonprofits to help um, voice how they want to see those funds um, invested, especially because so much of the work in terms of the recovery for vulnerable communities will be done by nonprofit leaders and by the communities. So just wanted to also mention that we had Congresswoman Spear here August 6th of last year to talk about the recovery. And at that time, the concerns were really around um, COVID-19, uh, around prevention, um, and uh, around a lot of work that was happening within immigrant communities. There was a lot of fear uh, within the communities, and I think uh, a large uh, focus of our discussion with Congresswoman Spear was around that. Um, there was concern about uh, just the economic recovery in general. Uh, we've come a long way since then, but I think uh, also um, we uh, are um, in some ways grappling with some of the same things. And again, this is our agenda for today. Um, the main thing that uh, we were told by Congresswoman Spears office was that she wanted to maximize her time with you. So the goal was to be done with the PowerPoint presentation by 445. So I'm gonna uh, speed through it. So um, in terms of the American Rescue Plan, what is it? It's 1.9 trillion, uh, there's an economic economic stimulus bill that's flowing into the communities, 350 billion to our state and local governments and its flexible funding, 65 billion direct aid to cities, towns, and villages. Uh, the American Rescue Plan allocations for uh, locally at the state level, $27 billion, at the county level, $148 million. And then you can see the allocations per city. So a lot of decisions are being made. Some have already been made in terms of allocation and we'll touch briefly on that. And then again, there's still advocacy happening. Um, Thrive has been involved in advocacy uh, with the governor, uh, with Governor Newsom around investment in after school recovery, uh, along with Innovate Public Schools and uh, lots of the after school providers were asking for 1.1 billion in investment in local um, after school education. That's just one example of the kinds of advocacy that's that are happening right now. American Rescue Plan funds becoming available to San Mateo County. We have a total of 288 million in two tranches, one time money, one time use. And you can see again how the allocations look here. And funds committed by San Mateo so far. Uh, this is San Mateo County. Um, 5 million for vaccinations, uh, 5.2 million environmental health fees for business, and then county revenue restoration, which is allowable, 20 million recovery committee requests. That's the coordinating body for the uh, recovery for San Mateo County, 13 million, and homeless infrastructure, 20 million. And the rest, 10.8 million, is up for discussion. So funding objectives, again, I think I am not alone in uh, finding that there has been a lot of information to track in terms of the American um, Rescue Plan and all of the, the kind of uses, eligible, eligible uses, ineligible uses, um, but these are kind of the objectives, support urgent COVID-19 response efforts uh, to continue to decrease the spread of the virus and bring the pandemic under control. We can't take that for granted replacing lost public sector revenue to strengthen support for vital public services and help retain jobs, support immediate economic stabilization for households and businesses, and address systemic public health and economic challenges that have contributed to the unequal impact of the pandemic. Eligible use examples, uh, replacing public sector revenue loss, supporting public health responses, addressing the negative economic impacts, cash, food, housing, 
and a host of other um, programs and eligible uses. Ineligible uses, things ranging from legal settlement, settlements, debt services, and a lot of these are very logical in terms of why they're ineligible. Um, we are close to time, so I'm just gonna speed quickly here. Um, in terms of costs incurred uh, expenditure rules, it's costs incurred between March 2021 and 2024 with a few exceptions. So there is a window of time to spend the funding um, by 2024 needing to obligate the funds and by 2026 needing to spend the funds. So there are going to be different moments of decision making and so advocacy is incredibly important. Um, and again, these are two dates in terms of distribution, May 2021 and May 2022. Um, and again, these are um, just examples of the kinds of funds that are gonna be available. Thrive has been very active in local county efforts, just um, in terms of the nonprofit recovery. We are part of the recovery uh, body at the County of San Mateo working with nonprofits. And we recently um, have been advocating at the county level. They uh, had budget hearings last week, the County of San Mateo Board of Supervisors did. Again, some of the uh, funding decisions uh, are not related to American Rescue Plan right now, but we know that that is coming. Um, but uh, we actually jointly joined forces with the SMC Behavior uh, Behavioral Health and Recovery Services Contractors Association and uh, nonprofits from both Thrive Alliance and from the Contractors Association, many of them overlap within both organizations, identified three priority areas uh, with a lot of specifics for each of the areas um, in terms of funding for nonprofits. Um, and what we're seeing, what we're advocating for is one, funding nonprofits in a way that covers their true costs. And some communities uh, like San Francisco use CODB, cost of doing business, uh, in terms of uh, contracts and funding contracts and increases in contracts. Others use cost um, uh, COLA um, and cost of living adjustment. And so we are advocating for this sort of uh, an aggregate for um, funding nonprofits in a way that covers their true costs um, across the board and um, not just for select nonprofits. The priority two is investing in strategic alliances to increase the impact and sustainability. This is really important. We saw naturally, organically, a lot of these uh, alliances forming, particularly in out of school time. Um, and that evolved into the Learning Hubs Initiative, uh, which was funded by the county. And we are advocating for increased funding. We're advocating for funding for collectives like um, COADS, community organizations active in disaster. And uh, priority three is let nonprofits lead the way in social and racial equity work across the county. We have a couple of specific asks, including investing in environmental uh, justice organizations uh, and also uh, funding um, work on uh, boards and uh, implicit bias in boards for San Mateo County nonprofits and a host of other uh, initiatives that we're advocating for. So this is a time for advocacy. It's a time to really um, note that nonprofits were instrumental in the pandemic. And so I um, wanted to update you on these things. Uh, we are a minute from time. So I'm gonna check in and see if we have the Congresswoman with us and then we will pass it over to her for remarks. Um, thank you all for your attention and uh, just bear with us for another moment. I see we have uh, some of Congresswoman Spears team here, Katrina, um, are, can you give us an update as to when the Congresswoman will be Yes, joining? I certainly can. She is styling in as we speak and oops, one second, and should be joining us in just a minute. Okay, thank you. Dialing in right now. Thank you. Okay, please make sure you enter um, your questions in the chat and we will be calling on people during the conversation. Um, okay, welcome. Uh, welcome, Congresswoman Spear. Thanks so much for your time today. We know you. Hi, Georgia. Good to see you. Um, Thank you. 
We have a nice audience here today. And um, I was just reminding everyone that we convened uh, almost a year ago, it was August. I think you were in Michigan, if I remember correctly. Um, and, uh, and we had a chance to talk about recovery efforts. And at that time, I think there were, st there were still, I think the primary concern was around curbing the spread of the virus. And um, since then, our nonprofits have been involved in uh, the, the prevention work, but also in uh, work around um, vaccine um, outreach. And I think our community here is um, just really excited to engage with you directly today. We have some uh, questions that we're happy to ask you, but I think what we'll do is just pass it to you for some remarks, uh, your insights uh, on the moment that we're in, and then we'll open it up for questions. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Georgia. Let me just get this a little adjusted here. Okay, can you all, am I properly uh, positioned here? All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Georgia, thank you. Um, and as always, I am delighted to be joining Thrive and the Jan Zuckerberg Initiative um, on issues of importance to us all. Um, I, I think from my standpoint, I am deeply grateful to each and every one of you for the remarkable generosity of spirit, the hands-on activity that took on, that went on throughout the pandemic. When I think back to my number of visits to some of the nonprofits and helping distribute food uh, in cars as they came through week after week. And I kept thinking to myself, this is the first time that some of these people have ever been in a food line. And it's particularly poignant to me because uh, my late mother, when she was quite young in the thirties, um, living through the depression, um, had told me a story about standing in a food line with her father to get, I don't know, bread, milk maybe, as a young child. And she vowed to herself then that she would never be poor like that again. So she kind of pulled herself up, pulled herself up by her bootstraps. She did not have a college education. She um, barely graduated from high school, but to tell you how much that imprinted her uh, when she was quite young and working at Fort Mason in San Francisco, she would um, walk to work to save the dime on the streetcar each day. So by the age of 28, she bought two flats on Irving Street in San Francisco with her savings, moved her mom and her sister uh, into the uh, flats. And then she rented some of the rooms. And one of the rooms she rented was to my soon to be father. So um, whenever I think of uh, people in distress, I think of the time in my mother's life when uh, she was in distress. So um, I think we've all been distressed over the last year and a half. We mourn the deaths of 600,000 Americans who really um, should not have lost their lives, um, but have. Um, so many millions of people are out of work. Women in particular have been extremely hit hard. There's 2 million women now who are out of the workforce, not even looking for work because the experience has been so devastating. It's the lowest participation of women in the workforce since 1988. Uh, so uh, when we look at how do we recover from this uh, once in a generate, well, once in a century um, event, uh, we invest in our people. And that's frankly what the federal government has done now over the last 18 months. Um, the trillions of dollars that have been spent to um, help lift people up have been really uh, important in trying to um, make people somewhat whole. But we have more work to do as well. Um, the Paycheck Protection Plan has um, generated over $800 billion in money to um, companies, businesses, small businesses um, throughout uh, the country uh, in 
subsequent iterations, it's been made available to nonprofits. Uh, we have also, as you know, um, done much around the employee retention tax credit. Um, that continues. The Paycheck Protection Plan has been exhausted. The Restaurant Revitalization Fund um, has been exhausted, but there is an effort underway, which I'm a, a co-author to try and add $60 billion to the money that we had originally put into that because it was used up when within the first three weeks when we set it aside for um, persons of color, women, and veterans. Uh, so there's an effort underway to make it available to all the other restaurants that didn't get to access that money. And it's important to point out that there are more people employed in the restaurant industry than the auto industry and the airline industry combined. So it's a sector of our economy that has been hit really hard. So all the efforts to, um, to go out for um, Tuesdays, Tuesdays takeout, which many of us were engaged in doing, all of the, um, the hot meals that were being provided to um, low-income seniors in particular, all was really very important. Um, the money that the American Rescue Plan has set aside, have you already gone through what the American Rescue Plan does, Georgia? We have, but uh, feel free to you know, go over a few of the key points. So, um, you know, it's a $1.9 trillion package. What is most exciting about that to um, those of us that have voted for it was that it lifts about half of the children in poverty in this country out of poverty. These $300 per child um, under the age of um, six and $250 for those um, over six that will be uh, checks coming to families in our country starting the middle of July um, for the next six months is gonna be a huge, huge benefit to families in our country. And it's our interest in making that uh, child tax credit permanent. And in so doing would provide extraordinary benefits. Uh, but beyond that, um, the emergency rental assistance, the homeowners assistance fund um, was uh, $37 billion in money. And then another $4 billion, $4.75 billion for homelessness. So the $5.2 billion that the governor has just announced that's going to be spent on paying back rent um, for people in California, that's all federal dollars. So uh, when people ask you, that's your ta taxpayer dollars at work for um, all of you. Uh, we are um, continuing to do um, our work in terms of um, helping schools reopen safely. And I think that as we look to the rest of this year, um, there is a robust surface transportation bill and a infrastructure measure that has been agreed to on the Senate side. Um, the, the Senate version is about one point, um, $2 trillion, uh, it will create jobs. It's gonna create a lot of jobs. 91% of those jobs that are gonna go to men. So um, I think we recognize that we've got to do something around childcare. And the Speaker of the House has heard from those of us who are the co-chairs of the Democratic Women's Caucus that um, there's not gonna be a, a reconciliation measure or an infrastructure measure that's gonna get our votes unless we make sure that there is a robust childcare component because that is where um, we've seen the biggest hit. And as part of childcare, we wanna make sure that the childcare workers get a decent wage. We wanna make sure that um, no one is paying more than 7% of their income uh, for childcare. And what we have found, and many of you have, have alerted me to, the fact that the cost of childcare is so high now that in many states, 29 as a matter of fact, uh, the cost of in-state tuition is cheaper than the cost of childcare in those states. Uh, one 
mother had said to me at a recent um, event that I held, she's paying $2,300 a month for infant child care. I mean, it, it's unsustainable. So um, that kind of gives you a flavor of what we've been up to. Um, we're continuing to work on the infrastructure and the reconciliation bill now. And um, my hope is that um, there's more good news coming your way. Thank you. We have some questions in the audience, but I wanted to first ask a couple of general questions. So um, in your role, you understand how your efforts at the federal level impact things here locally. So um, what's your thought on how, what will the effect of this American Rescue Plan um, be on San Mateo County? How should the funds be used? And a little bit more about what your role will be in implementing the plan and its benefits. So the American Rescue Plan sends the money to the states and the states to the county. So my role uh, can be one of oversight potentially, but those decisions are going to be made at a local level. And I will say that I've been very impressed by the county manager, Mike Callagy and the board of supervisors, because they've been very inventive and creative in how they've spent the money. I mean, I, I think we bought maybe three hotels now for um, housing. And I think they're in the position of buying another two. Um, so it's um, very smart um, utilization of the funds. And then San Mateo County Strong, working with um, the San Mateo County Development Association, SAMCEDA, and um, the credit unions have also created programs to provide grants to small businesses. So kind of after we pass it, it's out of our hands and into the states and the counties. But if you have any particular concerns or you want to encourage the money go a certain way, you certainly can convey that to me and I'll convey it to the county in an effort to try and influence um, their decision making. Thank you. All right. I know I'm having some volume issues. We've had a few technical issues today, so sorry about that. I'm, I'm going to call in a couple of members of the audience and we can return to our questions. Let's start with the first question from Bart Charlo, if you don't mind asking it live, Bart. Okay, well, hi, Jackie, and, hi, thank, Bart. You and thank you and your incredible staff for all you do in DC and all you do for us here at home. And anytime you wanna come back and you know deliver food on the line, I still got the line. I will, <laughs> I absolutely will. Very heartwarming and um, I encourage no. everyone to, to do it. It's, it's a great thing to do, it's, it's very gratifying. You, one of our biggest concerns, of course, is the rental crisis. And we're so delighted you know, that the American Rescue Act gives that possibility through the state and that the state is finally seeing their way to really make this happen. But it's only gonna happen if we can get the funding out there to the people who need it. As I look through what the delays are in getting it through, I thought it was just a statewide problem. I'm discovering it's a nationwide problem. And the base of some of the difficulty is apparently that the treasury has put a lot of onerous uh, conditions on it and a lot of onerous reporting requirements. Is there anything you can do to kind of get them to lighten up a little bit so we can get the job done? So Bart, I, I was not aware of that. Um, supposedly this rental assistance can be made uh, available. Originally it was only to the landlord. Now you can seek it as a renter as well. And you seek that uh, money through the county. So I don't understand where the, um, the, the log jam is or the bottleneck then. So if, if there's more to it than that, um, I'm happy to, to facilitate um, either a meeting with Treasury if that's necessary or uh, make our case. But my understanding is it should, once the money gets to the county, you apply for that money uh, at the county level. Actually, we're applying at the state level and there are difficulties, but what I'll do is I'll talk with your local staff and I'll get them more details. So okay, we don't have to perfect. go through that today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Lucy uh, Carter from Cal Nonprofits on donor advised funds. And Lucy, if you'd like to ask that live, please jump in. Otherwise we will ask on your behalf. Yes, I'd be happy to. Hi, Congresswoman. Uh, we met probably 25 years ago when I was on the Commission for the Status of Women and Girls for San Mateo County. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> I'm quite, 
quite a while ago. Um, yes, there is a bill on the Senate side, the ACE Act, that is a King Grassley, you know, bipartisan right. bill that would help get more money to nonprofits and communities quicker, uh, money that's been sitting in donor advice funds. And I was just wondering if you anticipate anything like that on the House side. Well, there hasn't been a bill, um, a, a companion bill, it's called, that's it, been introduced on the House side. And there aren't many co-sponsors of that measure on the Senate side. So that would suggest to me that it has not gained a lot of traction yet. Um, I think there is a reluctance to tell a donor that you have to, um, you know, somehow distribute your money within 15 years. And I think what they don't appreciate that there's an option. You can get that 50% deduction if you do it within 15 years and if you don't want to do it over that time frame um, you, you won't get that deduction on the front end you'll get it um, after you have actually distributed all of those funds so I think it's a uh, it's a nascent proposal so I can't guarantee you that anything's going to happen this year on it but it, it's worthy of our review and exploration of, of how that will um, be received. And I'll reach out to um, Senator Grassley and, and uh, King to find out more about it. Um, that's what I know right now. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh-huh. Thanks, Lucy. We have a question from Pam from Hillbarn Theater. Uh, Pam, if you'd like to ask live, jump in. Okay, this question is about the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. I don't know if you have heard much about that, but they would love- um, Pam, Pam just didn't unmute, so Pam, I, go I'm, ahead. I'm here, I'm so sorry. Good afternoon, Congresswoman. We've met several Hi. times at Bill Barn Functions. Thank you for joining us. Um, my question is about the Shuttered Venue Grant and the huge right. delay that, it, that has happened getting funds out, or at least award letters, we had that horrible delay with SBA and um, we're in, in need if we're ever going to open up our arts organizations. Can you speak to that for us today? Well, there's about uh, $1.25 billion in that uh, fund. You can receive it even though you've received the PPP loan and my understanding, it's for, you know, you would be a perfect recipient of those funds at, at Hillbarn because it's really limited to either um, live theatrical um, programming or uh, movie theaters. So- Right, we've applied. All right, so what you want then for me is to find out where your- What's, what's um, the delay? You know, there was the two week delay when they didn't, they couldn't process any applications. Then we all applied and they said that they would start telling us at the beginning of June who would be receiving it. And it's now the beginning of July and we've heard nothing. Okay, so let me, let me do some reconnaissance for you. Um, Wonderful. And we'll find out you know, where you are in the queue and what the delay is and we'll get back to you, okay? Thank I don't know so off the top of my head. You know, there is a lot going on back here as you well imagine. Oh, and I appreciate everything you're doing, thank you. Okay, yeah, well, we'll get back to you. Uh, we have Tracy from Second Harvest Food Bank wanting to ask a question. Um, Tracy, feel free to jump in. God bless well, Second Harvest Food Bank. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you, Congresswoman Spear. We really uh, appreciate you distributing food with us at the very beginning of the pandemic, when frankly, I was not so happy to see you there being exposed to so many people, but, uh, <laughs> but you were gonna be out there whether I tried to stop you or not. Um, and we appreciated your help. Um, we are uh, continuing to really serve um, close to the same number of people with our partners like Samaritan House, uh, nearly half a million across both counties. 
Um, we're really grateful for all the amazing support that the Congress is providing and that that's finally getting out to people. The child tax credit is just amazing. So, you know, so many great things really going on and we're so appreciative. Um, one thing that is concerning for us is we're still looking at what we'd consider to be kind of a federal food cliff. Um, there was so much federal food provided last year that if you look across what's currently promised to food banks, we're still about $2 billion short. And since we're not seeing the need decline, we're continuing to kind of raise the, the volume with USDA that that food needs to get out through the food bank, bank channels. I think they have some more funding and maybe haven't decided what they're doing with it yet, but it's hard for us to plan if we don't know how much is, is coming down the pike. Okay, let's, um, we'll, we'll look into that and find out um, where they are in, well, how much money they have left, because there still is money that has not yet circulated, as we all know. But my good Republican colleagues on the Senate side want to take that and put it into infrastructure. And uh, so that's a part of what may be happening here. They want to take about 500 billion um, that has not been used. And I'm presuming it's, it's unused, not, um, funds that could still be distributed. Um, but we'll look into it and get back to you, okay? Great, we'll be calling you on bills and things. I just wanted to share also that if Gavin Newsom signs the budget tomorrow, we will have school meals for all in California. And that is another like huge anti-poverty thing. And um, we'll be tackling it at the federal level too, but we'll at least get it done for California, which we're- That's supporting. great, Tracy. You know, that um, they've, you know, like the use of the, the federal funds to pay back um, all the landlords on behalf of renters, um, making sure there's a hot lunch or hot breakfast for kids is huge. I think sometimes we forget um, how significant that is in a, a child's ability to learn. So that's a, a great, that's why we live in California though. You know, the truth <laughs> of the matter is that's why. We, Thank you. Uh -huh. And I want to mention that uh, Representative uh, Spears' staff has written in the chat. They've uh, I, they've included contact information. Uh, Sarah, who is a point person on um, housing and other issues, has said, forward any concerns uh, around delays in the federal programs to her email address, uh, S-E-R-A dot A-L-P-T-E-K-I-N at mail.house.gov and they will do their best to figure out how they can get things moving. So thank you uh, for your um, willingness to do that. Uh, we have a question from Eleanor Britter around children's health education funds and uh, Congresswoman, if you could speak generally to that issue. Um, there are some concerns that that hasn't um, been at the forefront and Eleanor, feel free to jump in if you want, um, but that's generally the question. Yes, thank you very much, Georgia, and, and thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, as usual, you've done an excellent job for us thank all, you. and uh, I mean that for every single nonprofit and profit <laughs> business. So I, I'm very concerned with the children, uh, and it's not just about uh, behavioral issues and their difficulties in getting back into the system. Uh, not just that, but to remind children that they have one body and they can take care of it, they're in control of it. And uh, we need to teach them how. Now we've been in the schools for eight years doing it on a volunteer basis with Lions. However, uh, during the pandemic, we put it all online. We put the entire curriculum online for children. So we are running a summer camp, an eKids Power summer camp, and we are doing a, um, of course, an all year program. So there is no funding that I see for things like this. Uh, and in order for us to do it with the schools, especially in the underserved communities, we need to have some kind of funding to help us uh, do this. Uh, we're trying to do it for free for most of the children, especially the underserved, but but um, I can't yet see my way to do that without any funding. So I wondered if there was any funding or talked talk about it for this kind of thing. 
Well, you know, there's, I can't say there's specific funding, but there's a lot of buckets where um, funding could be made available. Again, it would be, uh, uh, my recommendation would be to request that funding through the county. I mean, I don't think you're talking about a lot of money, right? That's um, right. And it might even be advantageous for you to um, make a request at a board of supervisors meeting to um, you know, each of the members of the board has a fund that they have full discretion at distributing. I think it's over a million dollars per member. Um, so, you know, that might be a way of doing it. There might be through the, the funding for education around COVID, there might be a means by which you could become eligible for it. You know, as you were talking about educating young people about um, their health and their one body. Uh, we had a hearing uh, last week in which the acting director of the FDA, Janet Woodcock came and testified on the mm. e-cigarette um, crisis. And um, the fact that the FDA has moved fairly slowly in responding. And in response to a question I asked, that I've heard of a number of cases where youngsters, 13, 14 years of age, have had double lung transplants because they've been vaping. And I asked um, the, um, the, the acting director, how much nicotine is in a, um, in a typical cigarette, e-cigarette? E she said, there is more nicotine in one draw of an e-cigarette than there is in a whole pack of cigarettes. Yeah. And the addiction to nicotine that these kids have become um, victims of is truly um, uh, you know, a disaster. And their, their lungs are scarred permanently. So the fact that you know, we've locally have banned it in many, many settings, but when you think of it across the country, it is just, um, Tragic. So health education to young people, critical need. Uh, um, so those would be my suggestions to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do cover vaping big time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We have a question from Irma Zopf. And Irma, if you want to ask it live, you can jump in. Yes. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman Speer. And, um, this is great to keep us all connected. My question is about how can we make sure that we uh, um, try to uh, attract the funds and make sure that they are getting to the most vulnerable communities. Uh, and I am speaking on behalf of my role and um, you know in the nonprofit thrive and um, and just want to make sure that we're doing the best we can on on how we can support you to track those funds? Well, I, I, you know, I have been pretty impressed with how San Mateo County has uh, distributed all of these federal dollars. If you have an area you think has been underserved, please make me aware of it and I will reach out to the county to make sure that every effort is made um, to do that. Um, for the first time in, in probably eight years, we have reinstated um, a form of, you know, earmarks, they're called community projects. And I've had um, about um, $22 million that was granted through the Surface Transportation Act. That's not absolutely done deal, but um, all nine of my projects got funded. And then in the appropriations process, number, another probably close to $3 million typically um, is going to be made available to each member of Congress. And those projects come to me um, at uh, the recommendations of local jurisdictions. So um, I could conceivably be a source. The county can be a source through the individual supervisors accounts or through the federal funds that flow to the county. So again, if you think there's a need that's not being met, please let me know and we'll uh, try to address it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we have a question from Roland Gennaro, Executive Director of Silicon Valley Urban Debate League. Thanks, Georgia. 
Um, thank you, Congressman Spear. I was um, curious if you could share and talk a little bit or speak a little bit to after school programs and, and their importance. You know, we've been bridging a lot of gaps with, with, um, with the hybrid learning and, and wondering what, and they're often neglected. And I'm, I'm wondering what we can do to make sure that we get um, some more attention. Well, um, you know, after school care um, and the, um, the programs that exist have not been ones that have been addressed through um, the stimulus that we have been generating as a result of COVID. There are ongoing issues around, um, you know, making sure that school districts can um, find their way financially to make those kinds of programs available. I mean, I think that's where foundation money can be very helpful um, and where uh, nonprofits that kind of focus on providing those after school programming um, can be helpful as well. But there's nothing in the last couple of years as a result of the, the pandemic that we have um, focused on relative to after school programs. Now, the extent to which we can make the, the childcare programs uh, more robust, more funding for that. We want, you know, we're trying to get $70 billion a year for 10 years. That's $700 billion um, made available for childcare. And that will be to raise the salaries, to create childcare centers in what we call childcare deserts, and um, to you know, create more childcare slots generally. Um, but again, that's not after school programming uh, for our young kids. So I, I don't have a great answer for you on that right now. It's really something to think about from um, a school district perspective and through the state. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from our Director of Advocacy and Education, Petra Silton. Hi, so we just heard the good news that the San Francisco Bay Restoration Act, which was authored by you, um, just passed the house for $25 million. So I would love it if you could Talk a little bit to that. Um, not everyone I think on this call knows exactly what it is, but we're very excited about it. And we wanted to know what your chances, what you think the chances are of it actually being passed through the Senate this year. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm very uh, excited about the success so far with this measure. Um, the Bay has been shortchanged for decades um, by the federal government. To give you an example, between 2008 and 2016, the programs invested in the San Francisco Bay amounted to about $45 million. Now, compare that, that's about $5 million a year. Uh, compare that to what was being provided to Puget Sound. Now, San Francisco Bay is the largest estuary in the West Coast. Puget Sound received during that same time period that we got 45 million, $260 million. And Chesapeake Bay got $490 million. So part of my pitch has been, you know what? This is just about fairness. And we've been shortchanged and it's time um, that we get our fair share. So this is $25 million over um, each year, over five years. So it'll be a total of $125 million. Uh, and I think when you realize how many jobs are supported by the Bay, it's 4 million jobs um, supported by the Bay. Um, and it's providing clean water to 20 million residents, really important. And about 90% of the wetlands in San Francisco Bay have been destroyed over its lifetime. So it's really incumbent on us to restore these wetlands um, and actually save ourselves from sea level rise because as you all know, um, San Mateo County is ground zero for sea level rise. So the parcel tax that was passed um, was very helpful in that regard. Uh, I've written to the governor and asked him for $200 million of this big surplus that they're sitting on right now that could be set aside for um, the Bay as well. And I'm hopeful that uh, the combination of all of those are going to be really very helpful in the near term, but it's absolutely critical. I mean, it, our, our fishing industries depend on it. Um, 
and uh, certainly all these other jobs that are dependent on it. We've got about a thousand species of animals, uh, including a hundred endangered species in our bay. So mm -hmm. um, really very important. And uh, we also wanna do something about keeping ourselves from being underwater in the near term as well. <laughs> and that's what will happen if we can restore some of these wetlands. Um, just, I'm so glad that you're hopeful about this bill and that you're hopeful in general about the future. I'd love it if you could talk a little bit more about some of the other climate change issues that are coming up and where you think um, things stand, but also if there's anything that we locally can do to put pressure on the national conversation to move that forward. So um, I should also say that um, the Senate is doing its own bills, both Senator Feinstein and Padilla, um, and they're even upping the game a little bit. They're trying to get $50 million a year. So somewhere in between, or if we can get $50 million a year, I would be thrilled. Uh, we attempted to get $50 million a year um, in my house bill, but then we had to reduce it to 25 million to get it passed. So um, I'm very optimistic about that. In terms of other efforts underway, um, the, the jobs plan that is part of uh, President Biden's effort, this is what's gonna be folded into the Reconciliation Act, has um, some really important efforts um, around um, the whole green economy and creating green jobs. Um, and one of them is to create uh, charging stations. Right now, um, there's only about, I'm trying to see if I can find the figure, maybe 100,000 in the country. Um, and we need more like 500,000 charging stations in order to really embrace electric vehicles. Um, I had a bill to, uh, create incentives for people to buy electric vehicles by uh, having a tax credit at time of purchase that would bring like a new electric vehicle, which tend to be more expensive, down to about the price of a new vehicle. So from $35,000 to $20,000, and then create a secondary market for used vehicles. So then, you know, there would be a bigger incentive for all of the fleet purchasers, um, the rental cars to buy electric vehicles because there would be a market for them um, in the, the secondary market. Uh, so um, we're working on that measure again. Uh, we're also working on it from frankly, a, another standpoint, which is the fact that these batteries for the most part are made in China. And um, we've got some cybersecurity concerns about them. So creating incentives for battery manufacturing in the United States is, is also very important. The biggest emitter of CO2 gases now is the vehicles, the vehicles on the roads. So we have got to focus on getting people uh, into electric vehicles and getting them into um, mass transit and rapid transit. So there's money um, in the American Jobs Bill that will also provide more money for uh, uh, transit agencies and um, you know other authorities that um, can get people out of their cars. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer from Post wants to second the appreciation for the San Francisco Bay Recovery Act. And Jennifer, if you'd like to ask your question live, please jump in. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks also, Petra, for um, asking about the, the climate work. Um, Congresswoman, just really appreciate your efforts for the Bay and uh, for our climate in general. Um, and I just wanted to ask quickly about um, any additional funding or effort to support our local parks. Um, we've seen during the pandemic how critical it is for people to get outside. Um, and we know that our parks are being overly loved <laughs> and that our local parks and open space districts need some support. So I'm just wondering if you can touch on the conversations in Washington about supporting our local parks. Well, Jennifer, you know, there, there's a typical you know, funding for parks um, every um, year in the appropriations budget. In terms of augmenting that, I am um, i can't imagine that there's gonna be much money available for that right now, quite honestly. I mean, there's so many um, important 
uh, demands that are being placed on us. And, you know, there's, there's a real push pull. There's a real reluctance by some of our colleagues to, to spend more money in this regard. And they don't want to, you know, tax the highest earners in the country. So, it, you know, that, that's the kind of juggling act that we're um, having to deal with right now. So I, I can't anticipate that there would be augmented funds. The one thing that's really quite, quite interesting, and I know you know this already, but when we had the um, government shutdown during um, the Trump administration and then um, once during the Obama administration, um, everyone was concerned about making sure the checks got out to social security um, recipients and the like. And um, there was this real sense that um, you know, the fact that government came to a screeching halt and that we wouldn't be, you know, people wouldn't be able to access whatever the government services were. The only thing people were really outraged about were national parks. Um, that's, which was a, a great wake up call for me to realize that's where the priorities are. And if you've been to national parks, you know why they're, they're so beloved. But, um, you know, in the, in the scheme of things with everything in this federal government, I was surprised that that's where um, the biggest outcry was. Yeah, I do think that helped us a little with land and water conservation funds. So I was grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I think we're about at time. We wanted to ask just one final question, which is um, since January, how has your work changed? What are kind of the um, biggest opportunities and challenges with the new administration? And then if you could just leave us with a few words on how we can support your efforts, uh, that would be great. Thank you, Georgia. Well, um, you know, it, it, it was an amazing um, uh, experience when those two Georgia races um, turned out to be won by Democrats, which gave, gave us the majority in the Senate. Um, we anticipated that we were going to be um, looking at a, a, a real defensive posture this year. In fact, uh, as one of the co-chairs of the Women's Caucus, we met with the president and elect uh, via, via Zoom um, and talked about all the things we thought he could do by executive order to uh, overturn some of the destructive acts by the last administration. And then when we won those two seats, you know, obviously um, very different set of circumstances. But I will tell you that, that January 6th was a, a nadir in my life experience in, in terms of our democracy. And I don't think for one minute we can take this democracy for granted. Um, you can see all around the country, this effort to suppress the vote now with various state legislatures taking action. And many of you know that I was in the gallery when, the, um, when that riotous crowd breached the Capitol and was lying on the, the marble floor expecting to die when the, the first and only gunshot uh, rang out. So, um, we have a serious problem in this country with what's called uh, domestic violent extremism. And it shows its head, frankly, in our military. Uh, it shows its head on social media. And it has taken all these disaffected people, whether they're um, disaffected because they don't like the politics or they're disaffected because they're anarchists, but they have found each other online. And that was a you know, toxic brew that we saw exhibited on January 6th. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to forget that January 6th happened. Um, and we can't, we can't forget. And um, whether it's the FBI or um, you know, other agencies, uh, their hands are full because uh, typically they used to be what they call lone wolves. But now because of the internet and the, um, the dark web, they can find each other and the interest in uh, causing mayhem continues. So um, that's a very sobering note to have to share with you. Um, but in terms of everything else, I will say that what we have done with the American Rescue Plan um, is extraordinary. And 
because money is so cheap right now in terms of the interest rate, it's allowed us to really um, lift up uh, the American people in a way that who would have thought we would have been able to do that just six or seven months ago. Um, so we're optimistic about um, the future, but we still have a lot of work to do. And we realize that. And there is still a, even though we have a majority in the Senate, it's important to point out, you really need 60 votes to get anything passed. And we also have a couple of members who tend to want to be the, the voices of, um, I don't know, the, a more conservative bent. And as such, you have members like Joe Manchin and um, Kirsten Sinema, who um, when they side with Republicans, don't create um, a majority, even for bills like uh, reconciliation, which only require a majority. So we still have work to do. And, um, but I'm, I am optimistic that we're gonna get some really important things. And in the end, we've really got to focus on the kids in our country. Um, they have really been receiving the short end of the stick. So with the tax cuts of 2017 that were probably closer to $5 trillion, um, it's time to invest $5 trillion in our kids. Now we're not gonna be able to do that, but that's the juxtaposition. Um, we spend six times as much money on those who watch our money um, than those who watch our kids. And it's time to change that. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Spear, on behalf of Thrive, on behalf of all of us here in San Mateo County, our nonprofit members. Thank you for your bravery on the House floor. Thank you for your solidarity with nonprofits. And thank you for your advocacy for the most vulnerable in our communities. And we are all working hard, I think, for the same purpose. So uh, we're so glad you visited again a year later, and we look forward to continuing um, our conversation with you. So thank you. Well, let me, let me just end by saying, um, you know, we live in a very special place and we are blessed with very generous people. And uh, I am happy to help any of you um, when you have fundraising endeavors that you undertake. I mean, what we saw during the pandemic was that people in our area were as generous or more generous than they were um, even before the pandemic. So. Um, I'm grateful to you for all that you do, and I'm grateful to our community for being as generous as they are. So bless you all. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.